Well, welcome to Possibility Project. Uh, this is episode number 52. We're in the fifth season. And today we're talking about microactivism, how we all can create change. And um, I'll talk about more about what Possibility Project, if you're new to this group, to this community. But we're so excited that you're here today and so excited to have our speakers and to talk more about this important topic. So if you are new, as I said, there's 51 other episodes that you should check out. They're all on the website, possibilityproject.org. They're on a YouTube channel and they are now a podcast. So I'll, I'll reveal each of those pieces, but you can check them out there. And there's also a highlight video from some of our early episodes that you can also look at. And the podcast is available on any podcast app that you support and you can find those episodes. I'm doing throwback Thursdays where I'm putting episodes from 29 on from season three on and then every time we finish an episode like today they'll also be um, put onto the podcast possibility project is a disruptive community uh, for change makers to really come together to learn and ask these big bold questions and it's all volunteer project for these five years <laughs> and so any support you can provide is awesome we have patreon um, if you go on patreon you can support all the technical fees for making this happen um, all the other costs associated with it it would be so appreciated so please check that out patreon.com slash possibility project so who who am i who the heck am i so i am heather hiscox my pronouns are she her and I want to talk about um, land acknowledgements before we move any further. So also, if any of you are disabled visually, I have light skin, red hair, freckles. I'm wearing a dark blue sweater today. Um, I have a colorful office with lots of artwork behind me. So happy to share this time with you. And um, I am joining you from the land that was kept and held sacred by the Thunaltham and the Pascoyaki people. Um, I honor these ancestral keepers of this land where I am now living, and I honor their descendants who continue to breathe sacred life into this earth. And territory acknowledgments are just one teeny, teeny, tiny piece of disrupting and dismantling colonial structures. If you want to learn more, I'm going to be putting a link in the chat after my introduction that will have information about Native Land Digital and an organization called Land Back. Definitely check it out. Um, also, I want to note that many of the guests that we do feature um, are from the U.S., so they do talk a lot about U.S.-based perspectives, but we welcome people from all spaces and places. So I am the CEO of a company called Pause for Change. I'm the CEO and founder, and I'm co-creator, curator, and now host of Possibility Project on my own for about three years now. Um, I do a lot of national speaking and um, featuring my work in a bunch of different fun publications. But Possibility Project started, the idea became uh, real-ish in March of 2020 when we were seeing all the disruption with COVID and all of the racial violence that we were you know, happening in the US and beyond. And so the first episode was in May of 2020. And we really wanted to talk about, you know, how can these moments that are so ripe with possibility and transformation really bring something beautiful to this place and so we just started having conversations with friends and then we felt like we were being greedy like why why do we get to have these nourishing life-giving conversations that are really helping us survive this moment why don't we start recording them and start to create a uh, community around it and bring people together so I also wrote a book last year, and I, I share the endorsement from Dr. Leslie Ann Noel, who I admire so deeply, but my book is called No More Status Quo, and I work with nonprofits, local governments, and philanthropic foundations to teach them new problem-solving skills. So the book's all about the stories and experiences related to that. So you can check it out on audiobook, ebook, and paperback. But the goals of Possibility Project are, number one, unite a community of diverse change makers, stimulate this new thinking and this thirst for change, really work collaboratively to see what's possible. And then it always starts with us. It always starts with our own transformation, our own reflection and work that we need to do so we can show it better for this um, social impact. So here's the agenda for what we're going to do together today. Uh, we'll have intros. Uh, our speakers will introduce themselves. We have what we call lightning talks about dysfunction and what's emerging that gives them hope. We'll have Q&A, so think of questions, pop them in the chat as they emerge. Add any comments you have, any like, oh yeah, uh-huh, anything you got, put those in the chat. And then at the very end, we'll have some key takeaways and an invitation to our next episode, November 21st. 
So the why behind this is, well, part of the why is because I love Nivi and Karen because they're amazing. And so I wanted to feature their voices, but we co-designed this episode to really talk about how anyone can engage in policy change, in this work, in activism. And we chose, you know, there's ways to do it through microactivism. So sometimes it can feel overwhelming to think about mobilizing entire groups of people or advocating, you know, really um, advanced strategies and doing systemic shifts and all this work. But there are ways that all of us can absolutely make a difference and engage in this work at all different levels. So I am so excited to introduce you to Nivia Chanta, CEO of Soapbox Project, and Karen Pei, disability advocate and community organizer. And we do uh, introductions a little bit different on Possibility Project. You saw their amazing bios in the reminder emails, so you got to see how awesome they are. Um, but we ask our speakers to tell a little story. It can be anything they want to share about themselves and their work. And it just makes them instantly human and brings them, you know, to, to all of us in a way that we can really connect to their stories. So I am going to ask Nivi to go first and please introduce yourself and tell us a little story. Hi friends. I am so excited to be here when we three were prepping what we were going to say on this. I, I feel like I was mind blown already from learning from my other two friends. So Heather, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Nivia Chanta. As you might have read, I'm the founder of Soapbox Project and we create joyful community spaces for climate action. I was thinking about what story I wanted to tell. And so I wanted to share with you just a little bit of the context of where I live and how the unhinged ideas I get during the day manifest into reality. So you can't see, you can't really see my background. Let me unblur my screen, hold on. Basically, I live on the ground floor apartment of this complex. So you can see all the natural light flooding in. We live on the ground floor with these tall floor to ceiling windows. So anybody can basically see into my apartment if I leave the blinds open, which I do a lot. And so I've basically turned my life into this social experiment. And one thing that I want to share with you is I have been growing this tomato plant outside our house and really hoping that it will serve as a community garden. But I think people feel very hesitant to take stuff that is not theirs or they don't know what it's about. So I have been lurking on people outside my house and I'm seeing them take pictures of this tomato plant. And sometimes I'm hanging out outside eavesdropping and they're commenting on how amazing it is. Anyway, it's the end of this season and this tomato plant is so abundant and I am stressed out that all these tomatoes are going to waste. So recently I have taken to literally chasing people down the sidewalk. I think they're probably scared, but I've been, <laughs> anytime someone's hovering around the tomato plant, I will leave my house, chase them up the sidewalk and beg them to take some cherry tomatoes. So I haven't figured out if I'm the nosy neighbor or the crazy neighbor or both, but that's, that's, an ongoing story of, of my summer and fall. Oh my gosh. I love that so much, Nivi. That's fantastic. I can just <laughs> imagine you being like, hey, hey, you like those tomatoes? Take one right now. <laughs> Take <two." laughs> it, it literally, that's that's what it's been. And if people are like, oh, I don't have a container. I'm like, I have one. I'll give you a container. Yeah, you're like, wait a minute. I'll be back. <laughs> put them in your pockets just fill yourself with tomatoes exactly. oh my gosh I love that oh that that's really good I'm gonna have to keep thinking about that one that's fantastic <laughs> oh Karen please introduce yourself thank you I have an idea what if you just put like take one for free a sign outside but then you might have like someone ask you for like your food license to so be mindful of that <laughs> you never know I mean I've tried helping our homeless and houseless community and I've been stopped because they want to know if I had a anyway my name's Karen Pay. I'm a mom um, I always start with that because I have two kids my daughter just went to college I'm in her room right now and it's so great to have this space just kidding I miss her a lot and I have a son who's 16 and he was born with uh, medically complex needs and has been the consumption of my life in a good way for the majority of my life um the story I think I wanted to share with you today without violating any VERPA laws or any sort of privacy laws is I am a volunteer surrogate parent through the Department of Education. 
And I have a kiddo that uh, she's had a really hard life. And I think having to advocate for her in an educational setting on multiple occasions virtually, because she's not even in this city is difficult. And I just see her continuing to thrive in the community of like having to be in a home with four other kids in her room, not being able to have access to her cell phone, her surrogate or her house parents manager took her on vacation during the summer. So she wasn't even able to do summer school. So she's like booked up with five additional classes her senior year. She's just like a rock star. And if she can do it without any support, I know we can make some change on our end too. Um, this type of program is usually available in every state. So if you guys are in the United States, you can always sign up to be a surrogate parent. It is volunteer basis and it is a commitment because you don't want to leave these kids hanging. But um, yeah, just advocating for their educational needs in a special education setting is important. And if you don't have the training, they usually will train you. So get on that if you can. <laughs> Oh, I love that. You're already bringing us into activism, letting us know ways that we can support and, and sharing, you know, just one of the many things that you do. That's so important. Oh, so oh, I can't wait to get into our topic today. It's going to be so good. Okay, so every single episode, unless it's a workshop and that has different type of structure and setup, we always ask the same two questions. And the first is what's a dysfunction or many dysfunctions that you want to disappear related to this topic? So it gives our speakers a chance to say like, what's messed up? How do we get here? And we were joking with Nivy, like it really is your soapbox moment to talk about all of that. And then the other piece that we like to transition to for our second question is what's emerging that gives you hope? What are you reading, trying, learning about, inspired by, and what can we all do to take action? What can we do to do the internal work and start to jump in and, and work in new ways, to show up in new ways and, and start to be inspired by and learning about all these different elements as well? So we're going to start with the first question. Nivi, I'm going to have you go first. Um, what, yeah, what are the dysfunctions? What are the issues? What are the challenges around activism? Let us know. Take it away. Can I say everything? I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> maybe not. I thought about this question a bunch. And the thing that really comes to mind when I think about the dysfunction that we're facing, and especially because I think all of us here in this space right now live in the U.S. And Heather, you mentioned that a lot of the listeners are U.S. centric. So maybe I'll start from this North American context is we are in a crisis of hyper individualism. And I'm, I'm glad, Heather, you said this in the very beginning intro, because I wasn't sure if I was going to go here. But I, I think it all stems from colonialist structures, which is not something that is talked about or encouraged to talk about but between activists and feminists and thinkers and writers from Dolores Williams to Valerie Kaur you might know some of those names you might not but many of the people that I really look up to in the work that I follow talk about basically I'm paraphrasing but the concept is that the same structures that are causing climate change that are causing racial violence that are causing gender inequality, those are the same structures that have existed throughout history, and it's the same driving function. And so I, I think that the more that I've gotten into the work that we're doing at Soapbox, and I mentioned this earlier, we create joyful community spaces for climate action. So we don't really talk about this, the big C colonialism word very often. But the more that I've done this work, and the more that I've asked what is the work that we're doing? It really comes down to hyper individualism, which I believe to be a function of colonialism, because the purpose of colonialism is to separate ourselves from the land and from each other and cause those deep rifts that really creates the water that we're swimming in. And especially in the United States, I think right now there's a resurgence of this movement of like, oh, let's live in community and have a village and all of those things. But we are still all in a society that is very, it's interesting because it's very individualistic without actually caring about the individual. I do not think that individuals are doing well in this country unless they are 
super wealthy and powerful, but we're in this mindset in this society that essentially the messages that we receive from ads and marketing and products and the internet and everywhere you go is basically look out for yourself and prioritize your own self. And I think that this is something, the hyper individualism is something I come back to time and time again, because when we think about the climate crisis or any of the other issues that I care about, that most of us care about, what one of the things that really prevents us from mobilizing and making change, I believe, is the loneliness that stems from this fractured society. Because if we cannot talk to each other and if we don't know how to use our community muscles that we have innately as humans, we stand no chance of solving any of our problems. So if we're living in our own holes and our own bubbles and we're not having hard conversations, we're not remembering that we all are responsible for each other's fate, I think we're going to continue going in this very dark direction. So that's my that's my soapbox is individualism at the pursuit of colonialist means. Oh my gosh. So many things that I put stars and underlines and yes, <laughs> oh, I totally agree. I'm, yeah. We're so individualistic, but like you said, we don't really care about individuals and we're not doing well, like all yeah. the data and all the just feeling right. It's just that loneliness. Like you said, people being, so alone on their own phones and their own bubbles, not able to have those hard and curious conversations. Yeah. And, you know, we're losing those skills to even know how to do that. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, it's just so odd being individualistic and not caring about the individual at the same time, because it's on one hand, the messaging is like, look out for yourself, but all of the messaging it's called deficit marketing. And it's basically, you're not enough. You don't have enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not rich enough. You're not strong enough. And so we're just in this weird spot where the individualistic messages drive us to consume more and distract ourselves more from the problems that need to be solved. So it's, Heather, it's weird. <laughs> Oh, you, you, yes. Preach, 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 preach. Like you were <laughs> saying all the things a hundred percent. Yeah. I'm just, gosh, it's, it's so true of, of being alone, but in your loneliness, you're told that you're not doing enough and you are enough and you need more and you have to consume more. It's yeah. Oh my gosh. So many good points there. I, I think we all have to sit with that one for a while. Cause there's so much to unpack. It's so powerful. Karen, I want to know, like, what do you, what have you experienced, and what are you seeing in your advocacy journey? Man, it's um, well, I've been doing this work for probably over two decades. I have a younger sister who's autistic and amazing, but um, one of the biggest things I see in our community is that siloing and hyper individualism. But it's within the agencies and communities and organizations because this fear of lack of funding to fund the idea rather than working together and remembering we're doing this for a community space. And I feel like it continues to propel us in this negative direction rather than pulling us back to community. And there's 25% of the US is disabled. One in 11 in Arizona are disabled. And yet we are one of the biggest minorities and we're all in the oppression Olympics here, but nobody wants to work together. And I just, feel like, you know, I've been there and I can admit that authenticity piece of me is like, I authentically, I've been there. I've been in that mindset of like, why well, I'm the only one with this idea. I have to do it alone. And then I had to really think this is coming from like ego, not like my heart, you know, and um, putting that aside and knowing that this is for the common good. And we're not going to see the end of these projects. We are just a little stepping stone in the project, I think is the biggest part of like this whole journey is knowing that this, you may not ever see the end, but know that you're part of it. And it's not about, you know, your a legacy in general that everyone needs to recognize, but your personal legacy. And that's an addition to who you are as a person, you know? So I think that siloing of information, the lack of transparency of funds that's on a systemic level within the organizations, there's all these, um, organizations and nonprofits getting funds without 
other organizations knowing about the funding because they're not on the in crowd or they're not considered a vendor within their state system. And it's like, why isn't this transparent? Why can't we see that, you know, this one organization's getting a million or $2 million when I could probably have similar statistics given, you know, what I do and, and I don't have access to the funds because it's not even available for me. So it's like we're all set up to be scared that there's not enough money rather than working together with our collaborative ideas and spreading that wealth out to make real change. So I think that's that's my big soapbox work <laughs> silo, lots of silo. Yeah. Oh, so powerful. Yeah, 25% of the U.S. is disabled. I never have heard that statistic and Karen and I both live in Tucson, Arizona, but to know that Arizona has one out of 11 people like, wow. And, you know, I've shared a little bit here and there. My husband is now disabled from his cancer diagnosis and it, the journey, Karen has helped me a lot with that journey. It's so difficult. So we, we just had a chat with this, with social security this morning, <laughs> like the lack of transparency is so hard. And, and yes, you speak to something that we see in so many elements of the nonprofit sector. And it's, it's the challenge that philanthropy has created in often cases of this, you know, oppression Olympics and this sort of scarcity mindset and fighting for resources and not sharing information, not sharing learning, not sharing funding. And it, it's not going to get us where we need to go because again, like reinforcement, Nivy saying it's, it's reinforcing that individualistic uh, perspective. And you talked about, and we, we talked about it when we had our speaker call um, that building cathedrals, Antoinette Carroll talks about that, that you know, in their work, like working with young folks and in, in referring to the cathedrals built, you know, mostly in Europe that we talk about took generations of people, fathers and sons of tradesmen doing this work literally over hundreds of years, over centuries, never knowing and knowing that they would never see the end of that full cathedral, but they were placing that stone and carving this area or painting this fresco, right? It's just, we all are part of this legacy. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything you want to add, Navi? Sorry, I lost my mute button. Yeah. I I would just add that the scarcity mindset thing seems to be one common theme that underpins this. And I, I have this thought a lot and I can't decide if it's a profound thought or a stupid thought, but I think about this, that everything that we need on earth is like the earth has given us everything that we need and it's not scarce. We have strawberries and we have drinking water and we have people and we have animals and we have nature and we have every single thing that we've built like my headphones or whatever it it comes from the earth so I just think about this a lot that we have every single thing that we need to both help us flourish and also to take us down and it's really our choice what we do with the resources we're given and so whenever I think about scarcity mindset, I just chuckle at my stupid slash profound thought that it's like the scarcity is manufactured and we made it ourselves because we have, a, we just, we have it. It's all here. Everything that's ever been in our existence has been given to us on this planet. And yeah, that thought just continues to blow my mind. Yeah, that I think that's it. It's a profound. I don't think it's stupid. I think it is profound. <laughs> it's something to think about. And you know, we've become, like you said, we've become disconnected from the planet. We've become disconnected from each other and from ourselves in many cases. And and Katie makes a good point in the chat that you know the numbers of disabled in the U.S. are and anywhere really are likely to rise due to complications related to COVID. It's so true. We're hearing more and more people that are you know, just exhausted and having symptoms continuously and, and, and long-term, absolutely. It's, it's not going away. And, you know, when I think about designers, we don't design for disabled folks, right? It's sort of right. like you fit into the normal, normal, whatever that is, you fit into the standard. And then if you don't, well, I guess you don't get to participate. Right. Stay yeah. home. <laughs> There's they, no bathroom for you. Just stay home. Stay hidden. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Oh, well, let's let's shift to the second question because I want to hear your thoughts about that, and then we'll we'll keep having discussion back and forth. But what is emerging that gives you hope, knowing that what is so frustrating and what you're seeing is holding us back? 
what are the possibilities? Like, what are you learning about, inspired by hearing about, and that you want to share with us and, and the work that you're doing and others are doing to really move us towards action? Karen, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I think people are educated. They have access at their fingertips on how to make change. And I think there's just so much more mindfulness. And I know we're hyper individualists, but people want to connect. I think we're all like natural connectors. And uh, from what I see in the work that I do is there are communities being built around change. And this is gonna be systemic change that's gonna impact um, policy. It's gonna impact the future of our kids. Um, and we're, you know, evolving and we're creating that universal design. It's not there yet, but there's people actually considering it and thinking about the ADA only passing, what, like 30 years ago in my lifetime that passed, you know, we're only getting better. And I think we're being more mindful and intentful about the words that we choose to use, removing some from our, um, our repertoire of words. You know, I think we're moving in a direction because we can be educated and it doesn't require you to be behind closed doors to be educated about issues. You can go on the internet and find the issues that you want to really participate in. I think people just need to pull that trigger and, and jump in and join the, the movement really. That's what I'm seeing hope in is people are coming together and staying educated. Yeah. And can you share more about your journey? Cause I think it's so important for people to understand how you got started and all yeah. the things that you do. Like it's so inspiring. I want you to share that if you would. <laughs> you always keep me so humbled. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't you think so it's humbled. inspiring, but I appreciate yeah, it so much. Um, Karen, I have not stopped thinking about you since our speaker call and I'm in <laughs> awe of, every, I, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, Gosh, I became a really young mom at like 19. I had my daughter when I turned 20. She was the first uh, person of color to be in our family. And I knew I was going to have to face adversity right when I had her. Um, less than a year later, I had my son and he was disabled physically and required a lot of care and treatment within that time without that foundational structure of having like a home at home. I just really had to suit up and armor up and um, you know, advocate for these two kids that I had. And throughout my son's journey and my daughter's journey, learning how to be, um, you know, intentful and authentic with my learning journey, because I don't know everything. I think it's important for um, me to just keep moving forward. My, my son has had 23 surgeries in his life. And throughout that time, we've woven in like the pieces of education policy and all those barriers that have come in between him and his success and until I get to that point I'll continue moving those pillars down so I can keep moving him forward I began a uh, policy work about 10 years ago we started we worked on a community project here in my city building an inclusive park. And then I went on to some policy around adding my son's disability to the uh, mandated statute to require insurance for him because he's not insured, which leaves me unable to make a certain amount of money. It leaves me unable to marry my partner who I've been with for 15 years. Um, it's really kept me under that level of poverty that will not allow me to succeed unless I'm super successful and can pay for his million dollar surgeries. Um, so there's a lot of barriers in place, but I'm still remained hopeful. Uh, about five years ago, we passed a changing tables bill um, with a few friends of ours. It's an awesome community of people. And, you know, they usually say it takes a million dollars or three tries to pass a federal, like a bill. And we got this done with no budget, really, other than just people showing up. So I know it can be done with the right sponsors, the right um, people championing your cause. And we have a state mandated bill to require an adult changing table in every federal building or a renovation of a bathroom with more than $50,000. Now we're seeing that that bill didn't have any amendments to hold these people accountable if they don't actually do that, but it's pretty incredible and remarkable that, you know, there is some change happening. Um, in the last five years, gosh, I have jumped around for a few different agencies until I finally just formed my own Southern Arizona Advocates. And um, I really wanted to continue to propel 
the education part of, you know, advocates in general, being a facilitator for other agencies, I just saw that there was such a need for parents to know that their what their rights were to educate properly um, for them and then also their kids and that legacy that continues. Um, and then recently, because we live in a state with school choice, I started a micro private high school for my son because the um, school setting wasn't appropriate for him and the private school setting wasn't appropriate for him at his previous school because once you remove them from a public school you remove those federal protections um, like the IDEA and FAPE and um, going into a private setting you don't really have any accommodations so my school Arius Academy um, we only have five students, but all of their curriculum is modified and we're going to make sure that they have the proper um, credits to be able to graduate because that's super important to me rather than just kind of rolling them through into adulthood and then setting them up for success. I sit on a board called APSI. It's a national movement as well as a state movement. And that's just ensuring that everyone has equal opportunity to employment and they're compensated without being paid sub-minimum wage, which happened for a really long time. And up until 2017, it happened in the state of Arizona. So a lot of the uh, disabled community were making just a couple dollars an hour for work that you know their counterpart was making minimum wage or a little bit more than. So it continued to keep that poverty line there and restrict people from moving forward. So the work isn't done. I think it's always gonna continue on going. I think the biggest part of being a mom in this is the unpredictability part of it. Like I can plan a month out, but if a crisis happens in my family, I have to drop that problem and help my son or the crisis that I'm handling. So, you know, I just really surround myself with a great community of people. Obviously two of them showed up today and, um, you know, they keep championing me to keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> I love that. It's so inspiring. And I mean, Karen just knows so much. Karen's just been such a resource for me and so many others. I'm like, how does this work? Navigate the maze with me? Like, can you just give me the primer? Because, oh my gosh, I'm under a tidal wave. So wonderful. Uh, and Nivi, I want to hear from you now. Like, what gives you hope besides the tomato plant and your <laughs> strategies and your strategies for loving people with, with veggies? <laughs> I want to hear like, yes, with your joyful, I want to hear more about the joy, share about your events, share all the things and, and what will inspire us to action. First of all, the fact that Karen's like, I don't know if I did that much and has been passing bills with zero budget and building high schools and raising children I think that is so amazing. So to answer the question of what gives me hope, it is people like Karen, people like you, Heather, everyone that's on this call, everyone that's going to listen to it as a podcast, because we are the only people that are going to save ourselves. It goes back to my everything on earth exists thing is I think a bunch of people have said versions of this, but hope is a verb. And when people, some people, when I tell them about the work Soapbox is doing of creating joyful community spaces for climate action, some people's reaction is like, oh, that sounds good, optimism. But it's not, it's not about ignoring that the odds are stacked against us. It's not about ignoring the reality of the situation. We're not going around being like, oh, hey, everything is great. Let's recycle and have a party and move on. And I think that the types of people and spaces that give me hope are the ones that cultivate the courage and the muscle to engage with these hard topics because I think that hope and joy and all the other nouns and adjectives you might want to use for this kind of work, they are on the other side of the grief and the anger and the pain. And I think that if you are not engaging with that messy middle piece, you're not going to get hope in the way that I think about it. And it's not going to be resilient. And I, I think then you have a very fragile version of it, or maybe a veneer of hope. And so what really inspires me is honestly being in community with all of you and seeing that 
you know, no one's making any of us do this work. No one's making us show up and be on a Zoom call in the middle of the day. In fact, the systems and the incentives are against us taking time and space out of our lives for this. Heather, Karen, and I know that it's extremely hard to financially sustain our own lifestyles to even be able to do this work. And so being around people that are making these choices, and it doesn't have to be in the huge ways either, you know, it can be carving out an hour of your day to engage with topics like these. You don't have to quit your job and be full-time in your activism journey. And so that just hosting these spaces through Soapbox and seeing how many people are coming to them and are engaging and are taking action, that that really, really fuels me. So I'll start with that, Heather. I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back to you because I'll, I'll maybe let you guide what else I should talk about. But yeah, in short, it's it's people like all of us here. Yes, I love that. And that's why I love this space. And it's been hard, you know, dealing with cancer with our family and the recovery and, and raising kiddos and being a caregiver for mom and John. It's challenging, but I, I have to show up because it is my joy, right? It is my my mm-hmm. holding space for connection. And amazing things have happened beyond what I even know um, from those connections, because that's what happens when humans connect, right? There's yeah. magic. Yes. There's unexpected and, un- and surprising and beautiful magic that emerges that we, we can't even plan for sometimes, right? It just evolves. I love it. I want both of you to speak and you know, you both so I have talked about it, but you know, one of the things that came up and I've talked about it a couple of times in episodes since Desiree Attaway was talking about this sort of um, mythology around self-care <laughs> and how we're told like, self-care, self-care. And I, as a caregiver, you know, (laughs) Karen, I've joked about this. If one more person tells me to put on my oxygen mask first, I joke that I'm going to place the oxygen mask in a very uncomfortable spot (laughs) because I I don't need to be told that. I don't want to ask me what I want and all those (laughs) things. Right. So like we're told self-care, self-care, get a massage, take a walk, work out every day, take a nap, do all these things. But what Desiree really focuses on in the episode that um, she was on was around collective care. If we had collective care, we probably wouldn't even need so much self-care. And so I would love both of you to talk about ways that you've seen that manifest or like what you need as a change maker in these spaces you know, doing this hard, exhausting work, often without compensation or restriction of even earning ability and, and, you know, all of that. I just wish, I want you to talk about the dynamic between self-care and collective care and and what your ideas are on that. Karen, do you want to jump in? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Karen. Well, it kind of makes me laugh. Um, Self-care, I think traditionally has been like, go get yourself like a pedicure, manicure, Like, you know how many hours I have to like figure that out and how many people I have to bring in for that to happen and how expensive it is now to get your nails done. No, that's not self-care to me, at least it can be for somebody else. And I think recognizing what self-care looks for you, it could be watching reality TV. That's my self-care. I love reality TV so much. And I could probably spend a whole podcast talking about all of my favorite people, but um, just finding what works for us and like being okay with like validating your own feelings. Like, I think that's hard too, is there's this weird critique, especially in the disabled community where it's like, if you're not doing more than what you're doing, you're not doing enough. And it's like, if you, all you can do is carve out a five minute micro break in the bathroom without someone sitting next to you. Awesome. Cause there are a lot of my mom friends who have to be with their kid 24 seven because they have seizures and they're on seizure watch. Gosh, one of my friends hasn't even slept with her husband in the same bed for 20 years because she's in with her kid. So it's like, how could you tell somebody like that to go get their nails done for self-care, you know? So I think just validating that whatever you're doing is enough and pulling people into the hole that you're in rather than, you know, just keeping it to yourself because the the capacity for compassion is way bigger than I think we give people credit for. And it can be embarrassing to ask for help, but a lot of times they'll come into that hole of you being vulnerable and sit with you there until you're ready to pull out. Um, I think those are my thoughts on self-care. <laughs> yeah. So powerful. Yes. Nivi, Nivi, tell us. I really, 
I have a love hate relationship with this whole self care thing and the the pedicure analogy or story really sums up the the seething anger I often have for this concept because it's like yeah you know if you are struggling and you're burnt out and you're a caretaker a caregiver family member you don't have time to go <laughs> pay like 70 dollars or something to get your nails done and so I, I, again this is all this is going back to my same thing about individualism and consumerism and the insidious systems is the version of self-care that is being broadcasted is a extractive capitalist version of self-care that's like hey I know you're feeling burnt out but go distract yourself by buying a bath bomb and lighting a candle and getting your nails done and then don't question anything come back to the same system and continue your next cycle of burnout and there are certain things that are more obvious you know the buying stuff like the retail therapy I think that's a more obviously capitalist thing but even very well-intentioned spaces and settings like meditation and yoga retreats I I think those are I think those can be really great I've been to retreats that have really restored me and it's also if we're not going to change the systems that are burning us out you know Karen is touching upon how hard it can be for herself and for family members and, and for friends to care for their families if we're not supporting people in these systems and changing the systems then no matter how long you go on your retreat or how much time you do yoga in your day you're still going to be returning back to this extractive capitalist hellhole and so when I think about this conversation about self-care and collective care first of all it is really really important that we care for ourselves and I think the way that we are told we should care for ourselves is wrong, but there are a few authors and thinkers and writers that I've really appreciated the systems lens that they've brought into this conversation. And some of those people are the Nagoski sisters who wrote the book Burnout, and it really focuses on the burden that women also face emotionally and the amount of unpaid labor that is leading to the burnout that we face. So that's one. Um, Uja Lakshman wrote this book called The Real Self-Care. And I was skeptical starting it too, because that had the word self-care in it. But it basically was exactly what I'm saying now on something's got to change if we want self-care to be an actual sustaining possibility in our lives. And then the last thing, this is, this is I would consider, I would consider this a micro action is watching, uh, I think her name is Sandra Dalton Smith's TED Talk on the seven types of rest. And one of the one of the newsletters we wrote for Soapbox covers rest specifically, which people don't really think of as activism. But basically, what Sandra Dalton Smith covers in the in her TED Talk is types of rest, like creative rest and sensory rest and spiritual rest that don't need you it, it's not just like going to bed and taking a nap that can be one of the types of rest but part of it I think this one's called social rest and what I found very interesting about the definition of Dr. Dalton Smith's social rest is this wasn't actually taking a break and recharging it was actually surrounding yourself with people who recharge you so I think that it's really important in this self-care, collective care conversation to think about who is giving you this information about the care you're receiving, because I am much more likely to trust someone like Karen that's like giving me tips on inviting people into this hole. I, I love that because sometimes you're in a hole and sometimes the care that you need is for someone to sit there with you. It's not going to the store and buying a new candle. So I think really questioning who is giving you the information, what their intentions are. And then when it comes to this concept of collective care, humans, we're, our brains are wired for reciprocity. It's something that has been deprioritized in our society. But I firmly believe in exactly what Karen said, that people are will, like our compassion 
is greater than we think it is. And I think so many people are lonely because they are craving the purpose of being supportive to one another, but we don't give each other the opportunity. We, there's a, there's this like backlash. I don't know if backlash is the right word, but there's this whole like therapy speak that's taking over the internet of, oh yeah, I have boundaries and I don't need to care about you. But I saw this, I saw this tweet that's basically like, if I'm your friend, I want to be burdened by you. And I really, really love that, you know? So like, ask your friends to pick you up from the airport. Ask your friends to make you soup if you're having a rough day. Like, you would be surprised if the, the ways that people show up for you and how good it also makes people feel to be giving. And also, if you put out those requests and no one's coming, like, I think that just means that it's time for it's time for new friends, which might be a little bit of a blunt or harsh thing to say, but I there are so many people like us on this gathering right here that are willing to show up for others, whether it's friends or complete strangers on Zoom. And so I just really think there are so many beautiful people that want to be pushed to do more and to do better. And those people are in greater number than we think. And I think that is what will rebuild our collective care system. Yes, to all of that. Oh, I love that. Yeah, and it's it's something that Karen and I have talked about of friendship because friendship changes with disability and having a disabled loved one. And I've had to reintroduce myself to my friends and I've had to kind of weed through and be like, it's like the, 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 the before disability, after like BDAD, right? So it's like, who are the people that are still there? still not like covering us with toxic positivity and, and ridiculous like hopeful statements like just in the hole and there's a, not a lot of people sometimes from the past that are in the hole that can really do that work and so we've talked about like sometimes you just have to make new friends that maybe you're also disabled or a little bit different yeah absolutely. and I don't think it makes them bad people it's just yeah. that we're not taught to sit with hard feelings this is kind of related to the thing I was saying about hope is we're taught to do the easy surface level distracting thing. So it's like, yeah, maybe you need new friends. It doesn't mean that your existing friends are bad people, but they are also choosing not to engage with the vulnerability that real friendship and real collective care needs. And so just holding that there's a lot of nuance in this conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, well, I, I feel like I would, you know, be ignoring that November 5th is coming <laughs> and then we have an election. <laughs> so talking about activism, you don't have to disclose your vote or any of those things. I mean, I like think a lot of us like vote, vote, vote. But with everything emerging every day with just the hot mess that this election's become and our democracy's become, do you have any advice that you would give to any of us? using your advocacy background, using your focus on joy and taking action um, that you would give us in preparation for leading up to November 5th. And many of us are reminding ourselves that it won't be over on the 5th, like the, the recovery and the chaos that might ensue afterwards uh, might also be difficult to navigate. So any any thoughts, anything you want to give to us for that? Um, sure, I can start. I, uh, as I mentioned, I have an 18 year old. She just turned 18 in October. So she had registered prior to her birthday. And I just got her ballot and like Friday. So I overnighted it to her it cost $32. And it takes a couple of days for the dorm to receive it and like process it. And I was like, if you don't fill that out, girl, like I am going to have a big conversation with you. Um, because a lot of people like, you know, people of color, especially, um, have notoriously been counted in on the vote. So I want to make sure that, you know, she, her vo voice is heard, whatever it is. And I think, um, it's really hard because I have a partner who is on the opposite side of the political spectrum than me. And so remembering the core reason of why uh, we are together and why we're partners and why I love him has to be centered sometimes outside of the noise of all the other shit that's there. And it's hard because you're like in defense mode quite a bit. And I'm always like the opposite person. So playing devil's advocate, he gets super annoyed at that, I'm sure. But I want I want him to know like there's another 
viewpoint of this like how could you be against social security when our son is on social security like it doesn't it doesn't fucking make sense sorry excuse my cussing but it just doesn't make sense so I I think just remembering the core piece of like they may not know they may not know how this impacts them and we all want to open up the space to be like open and vulnerable but some people are never going to allow you that vulnerability so like stop wasting your energy on it and remember like they're still going to be there after the election day like it's not going to change I have a friend who's running for school board and she's a mom she's a therapist she's amazing she would do amazing things and school board by the way is a volunteer position but you have to um, actively like go out and get signatures to be elected and I've been advocating for her and going through the electoral process with her, but she's so burned out and we're not even at election. And she's like, do you want to help me make phone calls? I'm scared because everyone's getting phone calls right now. I don't want them to like block me because of that reason. I'm like, how sad is this? This top qualified person can't even be on a school board because she's already at capacity being a mom, a therapist, you know, wife, all those things. And then she has to deal with this bullshit. Like it just, it doesn't make sense. So those are my two cents. Just stay, stay engaged. Remember there's people on the other side, but they not may not even want to hear what you're saying. Yeah. And you bring up such a good point of who actually has the capacity to run for office, the financial ability, capacity, time, energy, and knowledge, right? It seems like such a difficult thing to navigate. Uh, thank you for speaking about that. Yeah. Nivi. Yeah. First of all, Karen, that is, wild to me um what you were describing about your partner and that sounds like a whole other future topic I would be so curious about because so much of what rides on this election whether it's on the presidential level or on down ballot races I I am I have been in a in a period of my life for a very long time where Although, like I said, I'm I'm not going to characterize people as good people or bad people. But for me, I cannot have like I cannot actively forge friendships or relationships with people across like who are, for example, voting for Trump, because it's like you are endangering my life. And I think we need more people like you that are, you know, have different perspectives because I think we do there is like a really important space for people to engage with people with differing differing beliefs and I I don't have the space in my heart to do that um but to answer your question Heather I think a couple of things I've been observing in this election season number one I don't know if people realize how close this race is and it's very, very close, the presidential race. And the second thing is I kind of feel like maybe we have collectively blocked out the four years of the Trump administration from our memory, as in, we as in people that are planning to vote Democrat or maybe even people that are undecided. It was bad and it's going to get worse. And I think there's a balance of fear and hope, especially in the next less than two weeks that we have towards election day. And something that I'm thinking about a lot too is like, where is the best use of your time so you don't burn out? And I think a big, big piece of it is reaching younger voters. So anybody that's listening now, if any of you talk to your friends, I'm personally not, I'm I'm just not going to convince people right now. If you already know whom you're voting for and if you're voting for Trump, then, you know, be be in peace, I guess, with the decisions that you're making. But there are so many people that maybe have just turned 18 or don't realize how to vote or speak a different language. And I I think that we under we might overestimate or over make assumptions around voting. Like I use this tool called Reach. It's a relation a relational organizing tool. And if you don't know what that means, it basically means friend banking of reaching out to people that you know in your networks and seeing having conversations with them and I learned that my brother is not registered to vote and it's not because he's a bad person it's just that he's younger and like not fully apathetic but he moved states and so it just wasn't something that is top of mind so I would say for this election really just question all the assumptions you have 
reach out to people that are probably going to be in favor of the same things as you just double check are people registered to vote reach out to the younger people in your life and see and then the last thing that I want to add to and this might apply to a lot of people on this call is there's a lot of these vague scary concepts that under a Trump administration reproductive rights are going to be taken away the environment is going to be further destroyed because fossil fuel companies are going to be completely unregulated. So there's a lot of these broad systems levels fears. But one thing that I really want to add to this conversation is if you are someone like me or like any of the speakers on this call today that talks about these progressive ideals, health care, gender equality, climate change, this administ the Trump administration, if they are brought to power, has no fear or shame around being openly fascist. Trump has compared himself to Hitler and has also made claims that he will threaten progressive activists. So I think it, it might sound dramatic if you haven't thought about it before, but our lives and our safety of people like me that do speak out, because as flawed as our democracy may be, I still, I can criticize the government. I can criticize our leaders. I... I don't think I am I'm a fan of a single politician, but that ability to be safe and know you can have personal safety is going to be taken away. And I, th I think that's something people don't realize is like if you're someone that's outspoken um, and Trump is reelected, there is a good chance that your personal safety is at risk. And that's beyond all of the systems things. So uh, I hope that's like a healthy amount of fear mongering of. I'm sure everyone on this call is already thinking about voting and being registered to vote, but really, really reaching out to people that you know, maybe joining like one phone bank if you haven't done so already, figuring out how to do that in a way that works for you. But know that if you don't, like people's lives are going to be at risk. And obviously we are not one person responsible for the outcome, but as individual people, I believe we have the responsibility to influence the outcome. So yeah, I, I'm scared. I'm hopeful. I'm angry. I'm all the emotions, but I'm also really, really grateful that there are so many opportunities in the next 12 days to get involved. And I can, I can share some of those in the chat. Yeah, that's great. Yes, please pop those into the chat. Mm, so helpful. Just, yeah. I'd love to add to that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, remembering that, at least within the disabled community, a lot of the adults that have disabilities do not have guardianship over themselves. So our votes are going to count for that 25% of people who are unable to vote. So remembering you're not just voting for yourself, you're voting for the person that these policies and um, new laws will impact, I think is one of the biggest things to really remember when you're voting and vote all the way down you know like I, I read somewhere like 20 to 30 percent of people don't vote all the way down the ballot sheet which is wild to me by the way um but just know what you're voting for I think it's important um to vote and and use your voice like that's one of our civic civic rights that we fall fought for so that's all I wanted to add I love everything you said <laughs> oh I love that yeah, and the, the other thing that a friend of mine, she uh, runs a, a newspaper here in town, is that many of the the items on the ballot, like especially the judges and people that we don't really know who they are, we're just like, yeah, sure, they're probably fine. They haven't been sanctioned. We'll let them go. Some of them were appointed by the Trump administration, and, and they've been part of the powerful entities that have shaped some of the policies at the different state levels. So some of the ballot measures that you're like, I don't know, it's fine. I like their name. They're they're cool. <laughs> no, no. Find a source in your local community that's done the investigative research to really show you who the people are and their alignments and their their actions that they've taken that will probably continue to take. Really, really important. While Karen and Nivi think about their um their final thoughts, vote, vote, vote. We've talked about it a lot, but please, that's one of my parting thoughts for you. Please vote. Please, uh, you know, vote your values, fight for your rights, uh, your own rights and other people's rights, like what Karen was mentioning. Um, 
you know, there's many folks in the disability community that don't have the right to vote or don't have access to voting. So you're really voting for everyone's safety and everyone's access to, to services and to their, their basic rights. Um, please think about Patreon. If you can support any sort of way, you can make a, a small monthly gift. It's really helpful with as a collective, right? All of us joining together as a community to make this work possible. So go to patreon.com slash possibility project. And then the episode, it's November the 21st, and I'll put a link in the chat. November the 21st, we're talking about the O word and why isn't talking about operations sexy? And it, it's so funny. We joke about this topic because it's like, why isn't it sexy? If we know, and Denise and I and Megan and I have talked about this, like if we know that it's essential, we have to have organizations that function and we have to have communication and conversations about this and we need funding to function even in these non-sexy ways. Why don't we talk about it in the sector? It's just ridiculous. So they are going to talk about all the things and the work that they do um, related to that. So hopefully you can join. And again, I as, as Karen and Avish share their parting words, I'll put the link in the chat for you to register and, and learn from those awesome people. But tell me, tell me what your parting words are, Karen. Like, what do you want to leave us with after all of the wonderful conversation we've just had um, as we transition back to our, our regular daily lives? Uh, what do you want to leave with everyone? Well, I really had a great time here today. I want to say that first. You guys are incredible. And I think I just want everyone to remember that, like, we all can make change in a small or big way. Um it doesn't have to be super massive, but it's just being kind to somebody for a day. So you never know what they're going through. And everyone says it online, but the intent behind it is, is truly, you know, try to make somebody's day. I have a phrase five before five and I contact five of my friends uh, before five o'clock just to check in on them because a lot of times no one else is. And I want to make sure that they feel thought of and loved and supported and you know it just we're all in this together and we're all going to come out together so we got to figure that part out of how we find our way back to each other I love that five before five yes yes I'm always sending what I call love notes to folks things I find on LinkedIn or things that make me think with someone send them a little text yeah it's beautiful it's so important Nivi what would you leave us with First of all, I think I've been the recipient of your love notes, Heather, and I just <laughs> really, it, so much of this activism, advocacy, entrepreneurship concept feels like if you don't win the end goal, all is lost. That's the dominant narrative. But I really, all the little things along the way, like, oh, I have someone like Heather in my corner thinking about me, that really really, 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 really goes a long way. So you inspire me to try to do a better job of paying that forward to other people instead of just keeping it in my own brain. So I'll start with that. And then on that, on that note, and this pretty much echoes exactly what Karen said is do what you can. You know, there's this idea that I think a lot of us have that since we can't solve the whole problem, what's the point of trying at all? And every little bit matters. You know, that story about the old man and the turtles and it goes something like there's an old man like putting turtles that are stranded on the sand back into the water and someone walks up to him and is like, what are you doing? None of this is going to make a difference when the tide goes back in. All of the turtles are going to be back on, stranded on the shore. And the old man is like, well, it made a difference to that one turtle. I'm sure I butchered the way the story actually goes, but it really is. It, it really is make a difference where you can and take care of yourself in a way that works for you, whether that's inviting your friend into a hole or sure, maybe a pedicure is the thing for you. I don't know your life. And so really just feeling that the responsibility of what happens to our future and what happens to each other and what happens to ourselves that responsibility is our responsibility. It does not mean we've caused all the problems, but I firmly believe that we have our own obligation to do the best we can with the resources we have to 
steward the future and to do our best. So yeah, do your best and take care of yourself. Those are my parting words. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yes, absolutely. We're all doing our best. And that's, that's the grace we extend to ourselves and that, that, um, self-compassion is self-empathy, right? Knowing that we are enough, we are doing our, our best we can. And that other people are too, like to Karen's point, we don't know what people are carrying. We don't know what their day has brought to them. We don't know what sort of coping skills they have <laughs> and what small child, small hurt child lives within their adult body. I always think about that. Like we just have to extend grace to ourselves and others and really, yeah, do the best we can to to heal, to help others heal. And, and that extends to our planet, right? We're all connected. As mm-hmm. humans, we're connected to the, the air, the sky, the animals, though the, as uh, some speakers have said, the winged and the legged, like we're all connected and it's not, it's not just humans too. So it's a um, beautiful thing to bring us back to. Oh, thank you both so much, Navi and Karen. You're amazing. I knew this would be such a dynamic and awesome conversation. Yay, yay, yay. I hope you all can join us on the 21st of November to talk about the non-sexy operations topic. And then December, we always have a holiday party every December, which is just an open time to celebrate and be together in community. Um, And then I have lots of amazing topics and speakers already planned for the new year. I think already through April. We have amazing folks coming your way. So please stay engaged. And thank you so much for joining. Take good care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.